Edward's about to do what you will, in just seven minutes, be doing for yourselves at these different, in these different groups. And what we thought it would be helpful is to, is to have someone sort of talk about, create a narrative, if you will, of what happened to create the 2008 surprise. Um, I think you're going to have to do it by saying, you know, the cause and effect view, which, by the way, I think, uh, has driven the Dodd Frank, a lot of Dodd Frank uh, remedies, is looks this way, and then you might look at it more like Brian and, and Stephanie and Claudio have tried to describe it. So you're going to take us edit through version one and two. Thanks, Richard. And I must say, it's a little bit daunting to be able to explain two versions of the crisis of 2008 since this problem in 53, and on top of it, in this forum, there's a lot more, much more qualified people to talk about it than myself, but I will give it an attempt, but admit my apologies from the beginning. I think that um, what Richard asked me is to think two different ways, two different versions that you can think of what set up the conditions for something like what happened in 08 or 09, as opposed to trying to focus on the other party. And I think the way I try to project two potential ideas, one of them, I will go through them in more detail, but just to set it up. One of them, I would say, is going through the regulatory angle in terms of where have we kind of understand that context and how to create it. And then there's a second one, which I would call the leverage angle that both of them, and they both can be, they're obviously somewhat intertwined at different points because it's impossible to itemize, but I think they drive different things. So let me focus on the first one, which is, I would say, what the regulatory angle. And I think here, you know, to make it, maybe to put it in the context, let's think of like, you know, five potential role players in the context of it that you can have. Um, the participants, you have like the U.S. homeowners, you have the financial sector in a broader sense, not just banks, mortgage insurers, mortgage brokers, all kinds of different participants. You have the government, not just the government, but the government agencies like Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, etc. You have Congress in the context of it, and then you have basically, you know, the broader American public, not just the individual person who's making the decision in the context of it. And what you can see is that. Over the decade of the 2000s, you had a basic situation where since the objective of home ownership, in the United States at least, was something that was universally not only supported, it was part of the American dream, it was part of, you were never going to think this, the concept of increasing and improving that dynamic was just overwhelmingly seen as a positive outcome. And therefore, any impediments or anything that you would do that would seem to be in some way disallowing that process at any level of your income level, etc., was something that no one wanted to do because it was seen as, you know, nearly un-American and in the context of it. As a result of it, if you look at it throughout the, de throughout the decade, there is an incredible number of, effectively, I would call them uh, omissions, but, you know, you can call it failures, you can call it even worse than that, basically across the system where basically not only was there no controls put up of different things, but actually the system stimulated. I think that to talk about the example of equilibrium and disequilibrium, this one was, a, this one, was one that was definitely a concave structure for what everybody was pushing. Not just the momentum was going, but it was pushing it. So the average person was incentivized to be able to buy homes, you know, obviously because of the tax structure. Effectively, as that happened, the agencies of the government provided even more funding to be able to leverage, you know, to provide more facility for more people across the income level to be able to do it. As that happened, it basically became a business because suddenly people realized that effectively, you know, you could make money out of real estate more than there used to be a certain portion of the population that used to be involved in the real estate construction sector, and then suddenly, like a huge portion of, you know, effectively, a lot of people who may have had other other talents enter in their business because of things. It created even more vested interest in that context, so you had tax benefit, regulatory things, government pushing of it, and basically, at no time, no one really wanted to do something dramatic to basically stop the thing. What happened as a result? I, you know, just following up on, I think, the gentleman's last presentation, I think about, we think about from a financial markets and the markets as, as a big container of water, effectively. You think of the financial markets and financial players will always feel like it's, we're like water. If there is a space, we will fill it. And you need to have some constraint to make sure you don't get to that space. But if you give me a space, I will go, because that's what we're supposed to do. That's what the profit mechanism is in. And what happened here is that, just imagine a container that was getting expanded, and where people were actually making more holes and more water could come in all the time from different angles. 
And that one was, was really was developing through the context of it. So there is a very big angle where you can see that there will be, you know, people will talk about Bank of Greek, people, et cetera. You know, there's all kinds of restaurants saying the regulatory angle and the basically at all levels, federal, regulator, state, government, in the context of it, was this, you know, was it in a way that people realized that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were unsustainable institutions? No, they've known forever, but no one really wanted to do anything about it. Did people think that people with no income, no job, and no track record should be buying half a million dollars home? I'm just saying no one would ever think that that was a reasonable thing to do. But you didn't want to impede it because it was, you know, politically as I said in the context of it. So there is one clear version in terms of what happened in 2008, that culminated in 2008, where the sequence of events that happened can be seen purely from the point of view of the failure of omissions in the context of the right things. And as it's really important that lack of understanding of what happens when you basically have that, that there's no, it's not all good if you leave a system totally uncontrolled sometimes and you create a dynamic and then effectively you never know what effectively triggers the whole and the something that over, over, effectively the vessel gets overloaded and then suddenly you realize that as a result of it, because the regulatory failure was across all levels, the interconnect comes through because the issue was at the homeowner level, at a lot of the financial process, there's whole industries in the financial sector that have disappeared. You know, there's no more mortgage insurance industry. I mean, the same in, in the context of it. And then also, obviously, yeah, the financial sector more broadly in the banks in the context of it. Um, it didn't help either that as a result of it, because of the U.S. philosophy and the basically overwhelming, um, you know, let's say, generally perceived um, superiority of the economic model of the United States historically, effectively the model wanted to be replicated as opposed to to controlled in other places. So a lot of places in Western Europe, you know, countries like I grew up in Spain, countries like Spain, Ireland, effectively were other examples. And how could you criticize them in the United States was something you know just saying it was it, 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 it created a dynamic that it wasn't just in one place, it spread out more and obviously we're seeing some of the consequences of it. So not to, I, you know, given that I've been told to keep it within a certain amount of time, I keep it, you know, this, so that's one version. We talk a lot more about that one, but that's one version. The second version is the issue much more simpler in a way that people are always fooled by leverage. You know, there is a very natural concept that basically um, the more credit you can get and the more leverage you can get gives you this you know, adrenaline rush in a way that makes you feel you can get even more leverage and basically the more you do, the people who want to give you credit want to also give you more credit and it creates kind of a virtuous circle that effectively builds on each other. Positive and feedback. There's a positive feedback loop as, as I think, again, in the context of it. And again, and this obviously is where it links a little bit of the regular thing, historically in the past, there's been this has been the major cause of all financial crises, you know, in history. It's always too much leverage, or is leveraging the wrong thing. It's, you know, you never, you know, as I, you never really have big financial crises when you don't have too much leverage. You have bad times, you lose money, you this, but you never tend to have financial crisis. And so historically, there's been a lot of constraints on the system in the context of it. What happened in the decade of the 2000s again is that the sophistication and the technology to basically provide leverage exploded in that way. Thanks to all kinds of new instruments that were created that, you know, in, 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 in previous decades you would have never seen or wouldn't have been allowed to do. Uh, you, what happened is leverage exploded. And a lot of times, sometimes leverage is obvious to see and people think about it and it's clear, you know. If you have a home and you take a mortgage and you think your home's worth a million dollars and you take a mortgage of a million dollars, you don't stress too much, you feel okay. And, but if you had a $2 million mortgage in your home, you would feel a little bit more stressed because you knew that it's on the complex. But that's kind of a very clear way you see the leverage in front of you. What happened is, thanks to all kinds of structures and everything, people just lost the ability to understand the leverage they were taking in the context of it. So not only did you have an explosion in the amount of leverage across the system, and this was not purely a real estate development, it was driven by what the real estate, because that was the asset based thing, but then it spread all kinds of other assets. But the complexity of the products that provided the leverage made people not even appreciate what uh, what the leverage. There was all kinds of issues regarding the agency incentives, and you know people had an incentive to do business because you got paid today, and the consequences of in the future. That's a total other topic in the context of it. But at the end of the day, 
group, you know, people willing to sell things and greed create some issues, but it's the leverage dynamic that really magnifies to create the connectivity. And so, what you had in, in the community in 2008, and obviously Iceland was a perfect example, but there's a lot of other, you know, is that leverage grew. I mean, I remember having conversations with Iceland events in 06 or 07. And, and we would go through them, and by the way, their credit spreads, I don't know how people are familiar with spreads, used to trade at 25 basis points. It was considered, you know, I mean, you get paid 25 basis points a year to have that credit. I mean, it was crazy how it was. And we would have this conversation saying, your balance sheet is bigger than your economy. <laughs> One bank, there's three, there was three big banks, Kaplan, um, Lendis, White, and Glidner, and each of their balance sheets was bigger than what it was. And we would go through them and say, look, I don't understand how you think that's a sustainable model. And they would say, look, you don't understand. We have all these risk management tools. We have all these things in context. I'm just saying, it wasn't obscure. It wasn't, I mean, there's a lot of leverage that happened in the, what they call, you probably heard, the shadow banking system, et cetera, in the context. The problem with a lot of leverage is that at the end of the day, once you get to a certain point, leverage is not supported by asset anymore. Leverage is supported purely by confidence. So what happens is, once you grow to some level, and everybody has their own definition of what that level would be, once you pass the point at which the asset or the business you have supports that leverage, any incremental leverage you go beyond that is, own, is dependent on the confidence, the investor trust, the investor dynamic in the system. And so, the, what people <coughs> didn't appreciate is that, obviously, we all knew we had gone way past the leverage dynamic a long time. I mean, everybody, it wasn't a very big secret, although it was great for everybody. Don't worry, though. You know, and the financial sector was the largest beneficiary, but not the only one. Um, you got through with this and this. And what happens is, once you, something happens, and in the case of, for example, in the US, the first sign of problem was, even before this chart they have here, they have this chart here of, of you know, timeline of the crisis, or from the, like the too big to fail dynamic. And I think the first action event was actually before that, was when two burst turn funds failed at the beginning of the second quarter of 07, which was seen as a, as, what happens is, when confidence starts crying, because it's, it happens is, it always happens the same. Confidence, something hits confidence. Mm -hmm. The system overall, is, what you will get is an overwhelming pressure to say, it's not a big deal. It's small, mm -hmm. it's contained, or, you know, I mean, you know, the chairman of the Federal Bank, who you would think is the most knowledgeable person of these things, was in the summer of us having begin a way, was still thinking the subprime issue was contained, even though there was clear data that there was no way it was contained. But the important thing is you have to preserve the confidence in him. Once you cross the confidence dynamic and you start losing it, basically you get into what I'm, I'm sure the folks from the Santa Fe know better, into this completely collapse dynamics where basically even things that you think make sense don't make sense anymore. Because once you go from confidence to no confidence, it doesn't really matter what you want to talk about. There is nothing that can happen. And therefore, everything comes crumbling down much faster. And what happens is the sequence is always the same. It's like the boulder going down a snow mountain. Et At the beginning it's small and it's a little bit and you don't worry. And then it hits here and it hits there and it hits there. By the way, during all those seven, no one was worried about Iceland that much. I mean, even though it was clear that things were coming. And then suddenly, every little time you get one more hit, one more hit in the context of it, and the ball starts growing faster and faster, and then basically you get to the situation where you get to breaking points, which is really what happened during 08. 08 was just a calm, accumulate, you know, there was no panic in 08 until the Lehman situation. There was some concern. Yeah, just to keep it to 60 seconds more, yeah. just talk about how the Lehman situation crossed the Atlantic Ocean. The oh, Atlantic yeah, so, so to give the confidence, that's yes. in, in a perfect example of confidence, when Lehman was going to, now people first never thought that they would let an investment bank go under. And obviously the administration was very aware about more hazard and, and basically tried to send a message they would not kind of let it out. And they basically came up with this construct, which I think, you know, both the book and the movie give a good description of it that they were basically going to try to force the system in the U.S. to take all the bad stuff in Lehman, to basically, because they said, look, if they go down, you all go down, you might as well just be willing to come up with a little bit. And they found a potential buyer in the U.K. bank, Barclays, for the group back, and that was the deal they wanted to do. And who knows exactly what happened during those phone calls in the context of it. What happened at the end is that affected the UK authorities, and uh, Alistair Darling, obviously, with consultation with at that time, Prime Minister Gordon Brown, apparently basically said, 
They did not feel comfortable barking and finding. This is the perfect example of confidence. The United States was giving them a clean investment bank. All the uh, toxic assets were being taken out. It was an investment bank that had a history of, you know, of you know, how it was a, you know, was the fifth largest investment bank in the world. I mean, it was a real institution. And the English and the, and the British administration had lost so much confidence in the whole dynamic that they would not take the word of the US Treasury that it was okay. Mm -hmm. And they said no, and then we did this. By the way, Barclays then bought Lehman out of bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that, you know, the deal eventually happened through the whole dynamic. But there was such a breakdown of confidence in that companies that they would just not believe even that it was clean. They just assumed there was something else, whereas the bankruptcy court said. So, again, regulatory, leverage with confidence, two potential ways that you can think what happened. But I'm sure I've missed out a lot of different things, so I apologize for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.